Blade Runner the Role-Playing Game was published in 2022 by Free League and designed and written by Thomas Harnstam and Joe Lafavi, with familiar names if you're into Free League stuff, such as Martin Grip with the art and Christian Granith for maps and layout. The game itself uses a variant of the Year Zero engine with closest ties to the way Free League's Twilight 2000 works. The rights were licensed from Alcon Entertainment and based pretty much entirely on two movies, Blade Runner, directed by Ridley Scott and released in 1982, and Blade Runner 2049, directed by Denis Villeneuve and released in 2017. When I first started reading this core rulebook, I was wondering why Philip K. Dick wasn't mentioned in the credits. As you know, he's the author of the novel do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, which is credited as inspiring the 1982 film, but Dick's original story and the world of these two films are very separate things, both fictionally and legally. With that in mind, I wouldn't say you would even need to consider reading Dick's novel before diving into this game, but it would be very, very much in your interest to watch the two movies if you haven't, but plan on playing or running this game. I do plan on going with full spoilers of those films in this video as a fair warning. 2049 has a cool plot twist in it, but the movie's going on five years old at the time of this recording, so you should really just watch it. It's a science fiction classic, just like the first one. Just to give you a clear idea of where this game's setting exists in the world of Blade Runner, the first movie took place in a fictional dystopian 2019 Los Angeles, and the sequel obviously takes place 30 years later in 2049 in the same megacity. This game puts you in the year 2036, 13 years before the sequel, but virtually all of the new technology from the sequel is in play in this game. So for all intents and purposes, this is Blade Runner 2049, the RPG, with the actual year being slightly different. The most notable thing about this game is that you play as detectives or investigators trying to crack a case, but the objective of the game is not to solve a mystery. That's more of a backdrop to the real story it wants to tell, which is one of confronting agonizing questions of self-identity and of human existence in general. I'll unpack all of that in this video. There's no better way to explain what an actual Blade Runner is than by reading this New American Dictionary entry from the year 2037. Blade Runner, colloquial name given to the specially trained human and replicant members of the police unit established to uphold and enforce UN regulations regarding the domestic use and abuse of replicants and other monitored entities and technologies deemed as public safety threats within Earth borders. The setting is essentially this. The world started to fall apart in the 1970s and 80s, and by the time it was the year 2019, the ecosystem had collapsed on a global scale, corporations ruled over megacities, and technology had become so advanced that humanoid robots called replicants were made to do most of the work. Those are the important aspects. The less important and far less described portions include the fact that the best of humanity has left the planet to live on nine different off-world colonies. There is pretty much no space travel in this game though. Your character will never make it off planet. They're stuck in the mega city of Los Angeles. I wanna keep it brief, but the timeline sort of goes like this. Global catastrophes of all sorts led humanity to create a new class of robot called a Nexus. The Nexus 1s through Nexus 5s were obviously not human, but the Nexus 6 models were. Unfortunately, they would go a bit haywire and special detective enforcers called Blade Runners were employed to hunt them down and retire or kill them. The company that made Nexus 6s immediately tried to make a better model. The Nexus 7s and Nexus 8s didn't work out either, but there were many improvements over the 6s. A new mega corporation called Wallace, just one year ago, was able to repeal the most recent laws that outlawed Nexus units and introduced the Nexus 9s. These are by far the safest and most reliable androids to date, with minds and bodies almost completely indistinguishable from humans, yet with built-in loyalty and safety protocols that have allowed them to backfill much-needed labor forces on Earth and off-world. So, the game takes place in a Los Angeles that stretches from San Francisco to San Diego with 30 million people living in it. They're hemmed in from the west by an impossibly violent Pacific Ocean, and from the east by dust storms and death. There is no plant or animal life existing in nature at this point, and everyone eats fungi and protein cultures reformed into various food shapes. Animal pets only come in the form of robotic entities called animoids. There's a lot going on in the city, but you're only responsible for one thing, really. Hunting down and usually retiring old replicant units that are either causing trouble or just unwanted. 
The thing is, the new Nexus 9s are so reliable that you can actually play as one yourself. That is, you can be a replicant hunting down replicants. And the intent of the game is to make that as fraught with social and emotional turmoil as it sounds. And even if you weren't hunting down fellow replicants, as a Nexus 9 unit, if you choose to play one, you're always distrusted and treated as less. Anyway, there are a number of things that define your character in this game. I'll try filling out a character sheet with you as a way to walk through all the steps. Step one, choose or roll if you're human or replicant. This is the most important question in the entire process and speaks to the very core concept of the game, one that's executed very well in my opinion. This whole game and really the setting itself is predicated on the tension between humans and these machines that are so incredibly close to human that it's on the verge of tearing society apart. The Nexus 9 replicants are all only one year old, but they have been implanted with realistic memories and have all the bodily functions and feelings of a natural born human. From a gameplay perspective, you have the choice of either being human, replicant, or starting as a human and later finding out that you're a replicant. That revelation can either be something you plan as a player, or as the book suggests, something that the GM can spring on you at the most dramatic possible time. But the possibility of being a surprise replicant should still be the choice of the player at the outset. Let's choose replicant for our character. The next step is to choose an archetype. Like in most Year Zero engine games, archetypes are just a suggestion of a character type, not very concretely distinguished by the mechanics. There are seven archetypes that each come with a key attribute, key skills, and a specialty, but you can mix and match those as you see fit. For our character, let's choose a skimmer, which is basically a dirty cop, and their key attribute is empathy. Key skills are firearms, connections, and manipulation, and their specialty is, let's say, kickbacks. Years on the Force will determine the number of attribute and skill upgrades that you start with. I'll choose Veteran. Our guy's been doing this for seven years, which means he gets a plus two to attributes and plus 12 to skills as well as two specialties. Okay, so there are four core attributes in this game, strength, agility, intelligence, and empathy. They are rated by step dice from D6 to D12. These dice, unfortunately, are obfuscated by a layer of letters, D through A. So a D rating means D6, C is a D8, B is D10, and A is D12. All of your core attributes start at D8, or C. Since I have two attribute upgrades, I can move one or two attributes up a step. Since my key attribute is empathy, that needs to be a B, so I use one point there, and I'll use the other on agility. I can also reduce attributes to increase another, like reduce strength to D to get my intelligence up to B. Also, as a replicant, I get an attribute increase to either strength or agility. Health and resolve are my character's damage pools, and they're derived from my core attributes. Add the first two attributes and divide by four, rounding up, to get max health. Add the second two attributes and divide by four, rounding up, to get max resolve. Replicants actually get plus two to health and negative two to resolve. The thinking is that they're superhuman in body, but frail psychologically. There are 13 skills in the game, 12 of which are associated with core attributes and one of which is driving. They all start at a rating of D or D6, but here I have 12 upgrade points to distribute, so I'll do that now. My key skills of firearms, connections, and manipulation as a skimmer archetype have to be a C or higher. Okay, here's a good time to explain the basic mechanics of the game and what these ratings even mean. Then we'll get back to character creation. Anytime you need to make a test in this game, you're going to grab two dice, the one for the associated skill being tested and the one for the overlying attribute associated with that skill. As you've seen, these two dice range from D6 up to D12. These are called your base dice. When you roll, you're trying to get a six or higher. Any six or higher is a success, whereas a 10, 11, or 12 will actually count as two successes. Two or more successes overall is called a critical success and usually means a narrative flourish to whatever you're attempting. If it's an attack, you get extra damage point for point. Just as with all these year zero engine games, you can push a roll or re-roll non-successes or single successes on D10s and D12s for a chance to get better results. If you come up on a one on any dice after a push, you suffer either damage or stress for each one, even the ones from the initial roll. Replicants always suffer stress and not damage when they have ones in this case, 
and they can push a roll twice, whereas human characters can only push a roll once. Advantage on a roll can come in the form of different abilities or situational features that are up to the GM to award, and come in the form of adding an extra of your lower die to a roll. So if you're rolling a D6 and a D12 with advantage, you'd add another D6 to that roll. Disadvantage in that same case would mean you would remove your lower die, the D6, and just be rolling one D12. There is one thing I'd like to point out here, and it's that the 13 skills in the game are for the most part far less complex in terms of what you can get with extra successes. In previous iterations of the Year Zero engine, like Alien for example, each skill has so-called stunts, or specifically described things that you can choose from if you roll multiple successes. In the case of Blade Runner, it's just a pared down presentation of skills here. Specialties, on the other hand, really do add some mechanical spice for players, where your character gets one kind of significant advantage or another. You start with more depending on how many years you've been on the Force. Alright, back to character creation. After you've sorted out your skills and specialties, you need to come up with a key memory. Again, this game is heavily based on the movie Blade Runner 2049, where memory is a pretty heavy-handed theme. Once you've defined or constructed your character's key memory, it only comes into play about once per session, where you can use it to improve a skill roll once, and earn a humanity point at the end of the session for doing so. The other thing you'll need to sort out is your key relationship. These are used by the player to deepen their backstory and ongoing story a bit, as well as the GM to strengthen the bond between the PCs and the story being told. A signature item is something you can use once per session to recover one point of stress, but oddly, if you choose a signature item that you can't carry around with you, then you can't recover that point of stress until you visit that item. So pro tip, make your signature item something that you can fit in your pocket. As far as gear, the standard loadout is a badge, a PKD blaster or 357, a little data device kind of like a smartphone called a knowledge integration assistant, and a hover car called a spinner. And finally, you describe your appearance, name, and your home. By default, your home is a government-issued apartment in Sector 5. Check this out. The floor plan for your default apartment is the exact same layout as Ryan Gosling's from 2049. Like I said, it's Blade Runner 2049 the RPG, which is great. As far as combat, it's very simplified and intended to be deadly. Your encounter space is broken up into zones of various sizes instead of a grid, and once per round your character gets a move and an action. Attacks can either use the firearm skill or the hand-to-hand -hand skill for the most part. It's also worth noting that there is absolutely no ammo tracking in this game, you just have all the ammo you need at all times. As far as harm, you can take it in two forms. Damage can reduce you to broken, physically, and leave you open to possibly fatal critical injuries, and stress can also be reduced to zero, leaving you broken psychologically. The critical stress effects are bifurcated between humans and replicants. As far as recovery, it's either in the form of a first aid roll for damage, manipulation roll for stress, or just downtime. There's a lot of attention put into the chase mechanics, which I appreciated. I'll just gloss over them here, but basically with each round in a chase, each participant chooses from one of six maneuvers in secret, then reveals them to each other in turn, rolling on one skill or another to resolve them. What makes it especially interesting is that the GM will generate obstacles from one of three tables, one for foot chases, one for ground vehicle chases, and one for aerial vehicle chases. I thought this was a pretty tidy but interesting way to implement chases, but as the GM, I'd probably want to just choose the best obstacle rather than roll for it after a while. I have mixed feelings about the setting for this game, which is of course the setting for the Blade Runner movies without any modifications. On the one hand, the visual presentation of the movies makes a world that feels so lived in and unique, or at least distinct, but on the other, when you unpack it over dozens of pages in a book like this, it really feels like a generic cyberpunk world. In this case, you have a megacity, Los Angeles 2036, that sprawls vertically with the ultra-rich living above the 100th floor of these megastructures and all the poor living below. The haves are focused on power and material gain at any cost, enabled and enabling the megacorps, 
and the have-nots are focused on survival at any cost. The climate is destroyed beyond any hope of salvation, and a single living animal is so rare that you'll be killed even seen with one because they're so valuable. It's all pretty familiar, almost painfully so, but this game does have one incredibly important unique feature, and it's the replicants. Let's start with the company that created them. I won't get too into the weeds, but it's a megacorp called Wallace Corporation, led by a single visionary lunatic named Neander Wallace. They introduced the Nexus 9 models after managing to lift the ban on synthetics, and now everyone's on edge because they don't know if the Nexus 9s will turn out to be the lunatics like the Nexus 6s, or rise up against humans and fulfill everyone's worst fears. But on the flip side, the human species, both on Earth and in the nine colonies off planet, need the tireless labor of these synthetics to survive. So what that means for you as a Blade Runner is that even though you're tasked with hunting down problematic replicants, if that replicant happens to be a Nexus 9 model, then the biggest corporation in human history will interfere in your investigation to protect their image. That's one aspect of replicants in the setting that's really interesting, one other is that you can play as or interact with these Nexus 9s who are pretty much indistinguishable from humans, but they're distrusted by huge swaths of the population and treated as second-class citizens practically by law. They are all allegedly programmed to have limited emotional range and a stoic demeanor, but no one really knows if they're all faking it in order to appear to be in order. So all in all, the setting's saving grace and really the focus of gameplay is this newest breed of replicant that not only seems poised to tear society apart at the drop of a hat, but also to fuel player angst, anguish, and quandaries of self-identity and morality. The chapter on how the LAPD is structured is fairly elaborate, but I'll sum it up for you quickly. Your status as a Blade Runner means you report directly to the top of the chain of command. There's an NPC named Chief David Holden who you can use as the top person if you want, or you can make someone up. There are all these different departments and stuff, but all you're really worried about is balancing two things. Your promotion points, which you earn by doing your job as a cop and playing by the book, and which you can eventually spend on specialties, gear, or money and your humanity points, which you earn by invoking your key memory or key relationship or failing a baseline test as a replicant. If you don't know what a baseline test is, watch the movie Blade Runner 2049. As far as what you can do with humanity points, you can only use them to increase skill levels. As much as I'm glossing over this chapter, it would probably enhance a game quite a bit if every player had a copy of this page right here in front of them the entire session. These resources are a key way for players to actually pretend that they're doing an investigation, and the GM should be generous in rewarding these resources, within reason. There's also this incredibly useful four-page spread for players, which walks them through a quasi-realistic standard operating procedure for detectives. You really get the feeling that you're meant to play as a detective in this game. But here's the thing. Let's skip to the last chapter in the book on how to run the game and look at these key themes. This game is pretty much not about cracking the case at all from the looks of it. In fact, as the GM, you're told to keep the clues flowing and to jump only from interesting scene to interesting scene. Because what you're really trying to do is create those personal and moral dilemmas. I think the first few times you play or run this game, the obvious vehicle to accomplish this would be to have a character be a surprise replicant. Or maybe have a replicant actually be a surprise human. But then you'd have to really branch out from there. The branching out part is what I'm most curious about because this game is heavily dependent on so-called case files. These are essentially scenarios that are structured in such a way that a player sort of walks through and uncovers clues leading to a finale that is ticking down from the start. It's a fairly structured thing, and this core book gives you the tools to create your own. But I'd be curious to see if Free League fulfills their stated promise in the book that more official case files will be published. Their starter set, which I'll try to cover in another video, includes a lavishly furnished case file that sets the gold standard for handouts and elaborate case construction that I would just love to see in future publications. Alright, here are my thoughts on the Blade Runner RPG by Free League. Generic setting backfill. I found a lot of the location descriptions in the book to be pretty generic, and this really isn't the fault of the authors. They're working with essentially two films that don't do more than a smattering of urban exploration. So all the extra details about a city half the size of California had to be made up somehow. It just came out a bit cliched. Martin's Grip. I feel like our old friend Martin Grip's artwork is a bit muddier and indistinct than normal in this one. 
Although I appreciate the choppy, dreamlike slapdashery of his style, I would have loved to have seen more clarity in these pieces, if only around the faces of the subjects. I'm left feeling like these were rushed or otherwise unfinished. Replayability. I know that there's a decent case file generator at the end of the book so that you can make endless different mysteries to solve, but I do wonder how many times you'd go back to the trough with this game to indulge in the dark, bitter quandary of existence, equality, and morality as they relate to humans and replicants. Product of professional passion. I think it's one thing to be able to write up 250 pages of a game about a movie franchise that you love, but it's quite a second trick to package all that up in an ultra slick presentation. As much as Martin Grip's hazy illustrations made me squint, virtually every other aspect of the book is laser sharp and dripping with passion. Captures Blade Runner. The game focuses on the exact things that make the Blade Runner movies fascinating. Being a detective in a neon noir setting is one, and grappling with the dilemmas of near human replicants is another. These two themes are even embodied in competing point pools at the bottom of your character sheet. There are always going to be people who turn their nose up at a movie tie-in RPG, mostly because they've seen a lot of low value, low effort attempts in the past. But you really get the sense that the authors of this one really understood the soul of the two Blade Runner movies. And their passion and understanding of those stories resonates in an intended game experience that echoes exactly what those filmmakers wanted you to feel. Anyways, that's all I've got for now. If you'd like to keep this channel going, please consider joining my Patreon. Thank you for watching. Links are below. See ya.